Shenley Laboratories, producer of Penicillin Shenley and Shenley Pharmaceuticals, presents the Encore Theater. The Encore Theater play tonight, Disputed Passage by Lloyd C. Douglas. Our stars are Dennis O'Keefe and Hugh Cronin. Tonight, Shenley Laboratories presents another in a new series of great dramatic programs. Some of our stories are fact, the struggles and accomplishments of great men of medicine. Others are fiction, stories of devotion to an ideal, individual heroism, or great courage. By these programs, Shenley Laboratories would remind you that medical science and progress are not cold, impersonal research or pages of statistics, but a warm human story told in living terms. Whether it's the life of one of medicine's immortals or the everyday record of service rendered by your own physician. And listen at the close of this program for an announcement of the utmost importance about radio's newest program. And now, Disputed Passage, starring Hume Cronin as Tubby Forrester. Lorene Tuttle as Audrey, and Dennis O'Keefe as John Wesley Beaven, who tells us our story. Walt Whitman once wrote, Have you learned lessons only of those who admired you? who were tender with you and stood aside for you? Have you not learned great lessons from those who braced themselves against you and disputed the passage with you? Somehow that explains my relations with Dr. Milton Forrester, more commonly known as Tubby, far better than I am able to put into words. I chose that medical college just because he was teaching there. Not only was he an anatomist of distinction, but a recognized authority on neurological surgery. Hundreds of practicing physicians were proud to be able to say that they had studied anatomy under Forrest. But they also usually added that Tubby was a brute and a sarcastic bully and anything else that they could think of. No, Tubby wasn't easy, and he aimed his words like a knife thrower. I'll never forget that opening class in anatomy. Gentlemen, you will quickly classify yourselves into the categories where, by native gift and intention, you properly belong. Only a quarter of the class will turn out to be better than average students, better than average doctors. Ten percent of the class, the top ten percent, will have much more to offer than diligence, concentration, and honest labors. They'll have self-discipline, and it'll be, for the most part, effortless and automatic. When the job becomes important enough to warrant your membership in the fortunate ten percent, the outside distractions will not worry you. And once, once in a blue moon, the upper tenth delivers to medical science an explorer, a discoverer, a trailblazer. Is there anyone here who will tell us someday what we want to know about cancer? Will one of you someday give us a preventive for infantile paralysis? The two important gentlemen who are to perform these feats are, if I may venture the prediction, already born. They may be students in some medical school. They may be in this room. Now. Everyone in the class sat motionless, transfixed. Those words shivering down each individual spine. They were meant to kindle a fire, and they did. That was Tubby at his most inspirational. A moment or two later, I had a chance to see him at his most sarcastic. And I will call the roll. On this occasion, you'll stand when your name is spoken so that I may identify you. John Wesley Beaven. Hmm. Kindly arise, John Wesley, wherever you are, and let the congregation see you. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. I observed by your registration form, John Wesley Beaven, that the first college you attended is a righteous little institution engaged chiefly in the manufacture and disbursement of creatures. 
Tell me, uh, is it your belief, Mr. Beaven, that on the last day the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible? Well, sir, it's a, it's a theory that hasn't been disproved yet. When you write home to your pastor, tell him I'd like to discuss that with him sometime. I don't think he'd be interested, sir. What? Not interested in defending his beliefs? Not interested in any discussion of theology that came from a professor of anatomy. Ah. Thank you, Brother B. Perhaps you'd do better if you stuck to your rhetoric. You may find anatomy difficult. We'll see. You may sit down now. Sometimes he was biting, sometimes unbelievably courteous. Sometimes he was angry, sometimes plain. Always he was a challenge. He liked to keep you fencing. He'd dart to any side of an argument just to see if you'd kept your wits about you. At Christmas, most of the students went home. But I had no place to go except my sister's, and she lived too far away. At four o'clock on Christmas Day, I was in the lab working over growing of some mussels when Tubby walked in. Nice way for a pious young Christian to be spending Christmas Day. I should have thought you might be playing Santa Claus at some Sunday school festivity. No one would have me. Not Tubby enough. Hmm. May I venture to inquire what you think you're doing? We passed this drawing some days ago. Oh, yes, sir, I know. I, I was just curious about it. Why? Well, as far as I can see, the nerves in control of these non-functioning muscles are of the same structure and caliber of those of the frontalis. Why haven't they atrophied? I see you're interested in nerves. Why? Well, I, uh, I couldn't explain, sir. They, they just interest me. Would you be good enough to tell me, sir, what I want to know about this one? No, I won't tell you. Pardon me. I won't tell you because I don't know. Well, then I suppose nobody knows. Are you trying to say something smart, young man? No, sir. I never was more honest in my life. I think that if you don't know, it's it's very unlikely that anybody else does. Oh. You uh, through with that thing for a while? Oh, I can stop, sir, if I... uh... I have to make a call. You might come along and have dinner with me as long as you've got nothing better to do. Well, thank you, sir. That's, that's very kind of you. We spent the evening talking about science. He was as gruff as ever, but somehow that gruffness didn't fool me anymore. Underneath, there was gentleness and a sort of kindness. However, he wasn't gentle as far as I was concerned. He was merciless in his demands, and the way he found fault with everything I did, I, I was sure he had a little use for me. In class, we were always crossing sabers, and Tubby would goad me into an argument every chance he got. Now, I know I learned by those arguments, but at the time, they certainly rankled. And at last, after eternities filled with charts, examinations, microscopes, and lectures, we were ready for graduation. On a day after the mid-semester recess at a meeting of the senior class, Tubby got up to read the list of internships. He started by deploring the fact that the university hospital did not hold a very large number. That concludes the list of interns. As for the special appointments, only two are being made this year. Mr. Thomas, whose work in blood and skin has shown great promise, will be invited to serve as student assistant to Dr. Meeker. And now... The other appointment. This, I think, may be somewhat in the nature of a surprise. If anyone ever tells you that these special appointments of the medical college are based upon personal favoritism or withheld because of private pre prejudice, this should end such thoughts forever. I am asking Brother Beaven to hold forth in my own laboratory through this coming year and serve as my private chaplain. <laughs> All right. That's enough. All right. Uh, do you accept, Brother Beaven? Oh, I shall do my best, sir. I, I, too, believe that the ship is more than the crew. You mean you don't have to like the captain in order to obey him? <laughs> That's what I mean, sir. <laughs> Gentlemen, this is a good example of the scientific spirit. That'll be all. You're at liberty. And so Tubby and I went to work, together. By the end of our third year of association, he not only had let me perform some of the operations for class observation, he had taken time off to lecture abroad and left me in charge of the class during his absence. Immediately after his return, he sent for me. 
I understand your work's been adequate while I've been gone. Thank you, sir. We're getting a case from upstate tomorrow that promises to be interesting. It's referred to us by Dr. William Cunningham. Patient's a five-year-old boy. My reason for calling you in on this case is because I've just had my lenses changed and I'm not quite accommodated to the correction. Yes, sir. The child's aunt is bringing him down. He's Chinese, I believe. Her name's Lan Ying. Lan Ying. A lovely, fragile name that meant English orphan. I wondered what she was like, and since I had some instructions for her nephew, I phoned and asked her if I might come up for a moment. And so we met. In the hallway of the Livingstone Hotel... And there might have been a mountain in China or any other of the world's most romantic places. Hello, Dr. Bevan. Won't you come in? I'll never forget how she looked that first day. She was dressed in a black oriental jacket and trousers. And her face was the face I had searched my dreams to find. <laughs> Sit down, Dr. Bevan. You aren't going to stand there staring at me all day, are you? Oh, I, I beg your pardon, but... Well, you see, I had heard you were Chinese and... By heredity and birth, I'm completely American. My name is Audrey. But by environment and background, I am Chinese. I was born in Hong Kong, Doctor. My mother died in childbirth. I was taken in by a wealthy Chinese merchant and his family. Your father? They knew my father well. He died soon after my birth. And so, Sen Ming and his family raised me as their own. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've talked your head off. Oh, no, no, no. Really, I, I'm very interested. Oh, excuse me. Hello? Yes, he's here. Just a moment. It's for you, Dr. Beaver. Oh, thanks. Hello? Yes. Yes? Yes, I understand. It's an emergency. Oh, what's the temperature? Pulse? I'll be right there. Bye. I'm afraid Yes, that... I heard. Oh, look, uh, I want to hear some more about China, and I... Well, I must talk to you about our patients, so... Well, how about having dinner with me tonight? I'd love to. I don't know what we ate. I don't know what we talked about. I couldn't tell you how we got to the dining room or when we decided to ride along the shore. All I remember is that her eyes were like no other eyes. And her hair was like no other hair. And she was like no other woman that had ever lived before or ever would again. And I remember that somewhere along the way, I I stopped the car and kissed her. I suppose I should say I'm sorry, but I'm not. Please don't. It would be very insulting. Even if we never meet again, that kiss will be something very nice to remember. I've never really gone with a girl. I guess I just haven't had much time for them. I never thought anything like this would happen to me. Nothing has happened to you. No, you're wrong, darling. You've happened. In just a moment, we will continue with disputed passage. But now we have an important message for you from Shenley Laboratories, producer of Penicillin Shenley. Most of us are familiar with the miraculous results achieved from the use of penicillin in combating serious infection. But did you know that penicillin is now used to prevent infections as well? In cases of minor surgery, for instance, your doctor may administer penicillin in any one of several forms to prevent secondary infections. Naturally, increased uses for penicillin impose a demand for increased quantities. Shenley Laboratories is geared to do its part in meeting that demand. In addition to penicillin in its original form, Shenley has now developed such pharmaceuticals as penicillin tablets and trochees for administration by mouth, as well as penicillin ointment and ophthalmic ointment. As one of the world's largest users of research on mold and fermentation processes from which penicillin and other antibiotics are derived, Shenley Laboratories has dedicated itself to a continuing program of investigation and study. It is our sincere hope and aim that this research program will result in the production of new and ever greater healing aids to place at the disposal of doctors everywhere. And now, the second act of Disputed Passage, starring Dennis O'Keefe, Hume Cronin, and Lorene Tuttle. A 
saw Audrey often through the months that followed. Either she came in for visits with Dr. Cunningham and his wife, or I went to visit them. For the first time in my life, I was enjoying every moment I was living. It must have been January when I got interested in the Buckley child. Dr. Forrester had operated on her, and she was recovering satisfactorily, except that her morale was bad. I did a little inquiring, and then I sent for her father. Hi, Doc. How's tricks? You Thomas Buckley? That's me, in the flesh. Mm. Sit down, sit down. What do you want to see me about? The nurses tell me that you're making Martha unhappy by sitting next to her bed most of the afternoon, criticizing everything that goes on in the hospital. Is that right? It might be. I'll try not to let it happen again. Can I go now? Uh, what do you live on, Buckley? Well, my wife makes little potholders, and uh, I peddle them. Mm-hmm. Where do you live? Over at the edge of town. A few cheap little houses up there. Just this side of the reservoir. Were you living there when Martha took sick? Yeah. What sort of a neighborhood is it? The ambulance got stuck in the mud. Had to be hauled out. There was another case of polio brought in from that district yesterday. No, Doc. Doc, that's not what ails the Collins girl. No, Doc. She'd, she'd had the flu and they were afraid of pneumonia. If they say she has infantile paralysis, they're crazy. What's the matter with you, Buckley? Uh, uh, nothing, Doc. Nothing. Come on, Buckley. Don't be evasive. You're withholding something. And I'm going to find out what it is before you leave here. Okay, Doc. You don't have to get rough about it. But if you squeal, you'll wish you hadn't. Now, this is what happened. There wasn't any water in our houses, and the old hog who owned them wouldn't pipe it in. So this fellow Billis said we'd do our own plumbing. You mean you tapped into a water main? Yeah. It wasn't much of a trick. Just your house and Billows? No, Four. Collins and another fellow did the digging, so I let them in on it, too. Uh-huh. When you heard about the diagnosis of the Collins child, you began to make deductions. You think it's in the water. I suppose you tapped into the main between the reservoir and the filtration plant, right? Yeah. Well, the whole affair will have to be investigated promptly and thoroughly. It can't be. There's more to it than that. This Billis fellow just got through serving a prison term, and he ain't going to be run in again without making somebody pay for it. Well, I don't know that it's that serious. It... Billis stole that pipe over in Wheaton. He had something on a fellow in Wheaton named Rusty who owned a truck, and he made him haul the pipe here. You start something that exposes Billers, and he'll squeal on Rusty. Then you and me will both be taken for a ride. You better tend to your own business, Doc. But this is my business, Buckley. The result of this investigation could be of tremendous significance. Now, look, Buckley, come on. What do you say? Let's, let's go have a steak and talk it over. I fed Buckley a steak, persuaded him that I would have to notify the health officer, and took him home. Then I went to meet Audrey. We sat in the hotel lobby talking, and my little universe rocked, and all the promises I had made myself about never falling in love dissolved and left me weak-kneed and about as coherent as a schoolboy. You're unusually quiet tonight. You haven't said half a dozen words. Oh, I... I've been thinking... It must be something very serious, the way you've been scowling. I've been trying to think of some very original way to say, Miss Hilton, I adore you. Will you marry me? That's quite nice enough to accept, just as it is. Oh, darling, you mean you would? <laughs> oh, no, no, you couldn't. You must be... Oh, but I'm not half good enough, but, but if you would, I... <laughs> darling, of course I would, and I will. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Looking back on that night now, it still seems like a jigsaw with none of the pieces fitting. Right after I left Audrey, Tubby came to see her. Yes? I'm Dr. Forrester. Oh, I've heard Dr. Beaven speak of you often. Come in. I wanted to talk to you about Jack Beaven. Of course. Won't you sit down? Thank you. I'll come to the point immediately. I've come to you to appeal to you. I want you to give Beaven up. Ever since he's known you, his mind's been divided. His work's slipping. He's losing ground. Oh, surely not. You think he loves you? Perhaps he does. But he loved his career for a long time before he loved you. I love him. I wouldn't interfere in his career. I'd be very proud of it. Unless he's completely alone, he can't give his best to science. But what you ask is impossible. Tonight I've promised to be his wife. Well, I don't know how much you love him. 
But you seem to me the kind of girl who could never be happy knowing that she was keeping the man she loved from his best accomplishment. There's no answer to that. There's, there's no answer to that. Hello? This is the hospital calling. Is Dr. Forrester there? Just a moment. Forrester speaking. We just had a very strange telephone call from Wheaton, Dr. Forrester. A man called up and said that Dr. Beaven had been summoned out there on some pretext and had been in a fight. A fight? Yes. Just a minute. Uh, miss, give me a pencil and paper, quick. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Where is he? In a deserted farmhouse about seven miles west of here. Turn left at Larson's Dairy Farm. Your lights will show you where cars have turned around. Go in the back door. Is there anything we can do, sir? No, nothing. Uh, but get a room ready and wait for further instructions. I'm going with you. No, you can't. I don't need you. He may need me. I can take care of him. I'm sure you can. And I'm going to take care of you. Tell me. What are you going to do about him? Whatever you say, Dr. Foster. Because you've admired him and loved him even longer than I have. Hold this flashlight on his face, please. That's right. Steady now. Will you want hot water? I could try and find the stove. No, I'm not doing anything now but a simple bandage. Uh, there's a very serious concussion here. Will he... Is he... Is he going to die? I hope not. Look, I'll have to do drive down the road to telephone for an ambulance. Will you be afraid to stay here alone? Yes. But I wouldn't do anything else. If he wakes up, is there anything I can do for him? He won't wake up. Not until that pressure's lifted. And only then, if God's with us... I'll leave you the flashlight. No, no. You'll never find your way back to the car. I don't like to leave you here alone in the dark. He's alone in the dark. I'll get back as fast as I can. Afterward, Audrey was never quite sure when it was that she first knew that someone else had come in that room. Perhaps it was the sound of breathing. Perhaps instinct. But suddenly she stood, a chill fear darting through her, and her heart racing. At last she spoke. Who's in this room? It's me, Thomas Buckley. What are you doing here? I came back. I came back. Doc was good to me. He gave me a steak once. I didn't want to leave him to die. Are you one of the men responsible for this? No. It was Billers and Rusty. They brought me out here to get me out of the way so I couldn't testify against them. I got away about five miles down the road and telephoned Dr. Forrester. I've been all this time walking by. Oh. Dr. Beaven hears of this. He'll be glad to have had such a good friend. The ambulance will be here in about 15 minutes. I have to operate as soon as I can get him to the hospital. All right. That's all. Wheel him out. That's the most the surgery can do for him. Was the operation a success? It was a surgical success. We won't know yet for several hours whether he'll pull out of it. I'll get you a room. You'd better get some sleep. No, no, I'll wait with you. Do you hear me? He needs you. He needs someone to work with him, to help him. You, you really mean you want me to stay now? You don't want me to leave him? My dear, really? my dear, forgive an old man a very human mistake. I thought he'd be better alone. But any man must be more inspired with a woman like you beside him. Dr. Tubby Forrester, I love you. Very much. Hey. Hey. 
Hey, what's going on? I close my eyes for a minute and I find you. Too. Darling. Oh, darling, how do you feel? Oh, pretty good. What did you do, Tubby? Look inside my head to find out what was in it? Something like that. Thanks. Tell me, we haven't gotten along too well. What do you mean? What do you mean we haven't gotten along too well? Quite better than any two people I've ever known. Man needs a good sparring partner. Okay, okay. I just wanted to say thanks for everything. You're welcome. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'll get on down the hall. I've got some sick, pa- sick patients to look at. You're a convalescent now. See you later. And keep absolutely quiet. If you pull any of those stitches, I'll bash your head in. <laughs> Whatever you say, Doctor. <laughs> Somehow I think this quarrel is over. I don't think you two are going to dispute the passage anymore. He's a great man, Audrey. And a great doctor. You're two of a kind, darling. No, Audrey, you, you may be prejudiced. But I love you for it. <laughs> Come here for a minute, will you, uh... <laughs> Kind of get in the kissing range. Uh, whatever you say, Doctor. In a moment, we'll bring Dennis O'Keefe back to this microphone. But first, may we leave this thought with you. Unlike most of us, a doctor can never forget business completely. Even when your physician is enjoying an evening away from home, he has previously left word as to where he may be reached in case of emergency. Yes, doctors are on call any hour of the day or night, and they're noted for responding to that call always. Shenley Laboratory salutes in this series of programs the spirit of constant service to mankind which characterizes the medical profession. Now, here's the big announcement we told you about earlier in the program. Commencing next week at the same time, Shenley's Crest of Blanca Wines will bring you the most exciting new dramatic program to come from Hollywood in many years. It's the Hollywood Players Company, which consists of such top-flight stars as Claudette Colbert, Betty Davis, Joan Fontaine, John Garfield, Paulette Goddard, Gene Kelly, and Gregory Peck. One of these great stars each week in a great story which has been picked for your radio enjoyment. Tune in next Tuesday night for the grand premiere when Claudette Colbert, Betty Davis, Joan Fontaine, John Garfield, Paulette Goddard, Gene Kelly, and Gregory Peck will all be here to tell you about their own company, Cresta Blanca's Hollywood Players, radio's freshest dramatic idea in years. Betty Davis will have that outstanding English actor, Rex Harrison, who has just scored such an outstanding success in Anna and the King of Siam as her guest co-star in the Hollywood Players premiere program entitled The Small Servant. All the stars will be here next Tuesday night to tell you of their plans for the Hollywood Players' first season on the air. Don't miss it. And now, here's Dennis O'Keefe. With this, the last broadcast of our present series for Penicillin Shenley... Shenley Laboratories extends its appreciation to those who made this program possible. The men whose lives reflect the spirit of devotion and service to mankind, which has been our dramatic theme. Once again tonight, Shenley Laboratories salutes America's men and women in white and proffers the hope that their dedication to the ideal of helping humanity may serve as a model for all of us who are now trying to build a better world. Disputed Passage was produced and directed by Bill Lawrence and was presented through the courtesy of the author, Lloyd C. Douglas. It was a Gene Holloway adaptation. Dennis O'Keefe is now co-starring with Hedy Lamar in the Hunt Stromberg production, Dishonored Lady. Hume Cronin appeared through the courtesy of Metro Golden Mayer, producers of the Technicolor musical Holiday in Mexico. This is Frank Graham speaking for Shenley Laboratories, producer of Penicillin Shenley and inviting you to listen next Tuesday at the same time to the premier broadcast of Cresta Blanca's new series, The Hollywood Players, radio's outstanding company of stars, inaugurating a season of great stars and great stories for your enjoyment. Next week, the first broadcast will star Betty Davis and Rex Harrison. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>